describes the way HFCs, the consumption of HFCs is moving in the, in the developed countries. Uh, these are up there, you, you see the historical consumption records or the baseline, what we call in the Montreal Protocol the baseline, and the green line is, describes the consumption and is clearly going down. In the next slide, I would like to show how the consumption of CFCs is behaving in the developing countries and is rapidly growing. This is the, the, the uh, figure of up to 2009. So it is indeed a challenge to uh, start facing down the, these HFCs. By the way, the historical base is, it will be the consumption of 2009 and 2010 at each individual level of the countries, that will be the baseline. And then this baseline will need parties, governments will need to freeze uh, on 2013 at that maximum level, which is called in our jargon as the baseline. Um, the next uh, uh, slide uh, shows another very big challenge that we are having in the Montreal Protocol. We are competing with uh, dwarfing uh, international resources. International uh, cooperation is being also hurt by the economic crisis. And still, there is a lot of work to be done in monitoring and researching on the way our stratosphere is behaving under a totally different ad atmosphere. Climate change is inducing changes that we don't, we, scientists do not understand yet. So the research must continue, and the vigilance, the monitoring of the of the of the atmosphere, atmospheric processes need to be continued. And so this is a real challenge. We need scientists. We need new scientists. We need new, hopefully, stu students that will become uh, uh, scientists in the future that will help us understand what is this intricate, intricacy, the intricacies and the relationship between the physical chemical processes and the stratosphere between climate and, and ozone protection. Um, one, um, so all those uncertainties need to be better understood. And we uh, recognize and scientists recognize that are not yet fully understood. And, uh, and one final challenge that I want to touch on is uh, the concerns uh, on the chemical known as HFCs. These HFCs are, are not ozone depleting, it's not an ozone depleting substance. But it is uh, um, one important alternative to phase out the HCFCs, which I show you in this graph that is growing. So, but HFCs then are a powerful climate, a, a powerful substance, a powerful greenhouse gas with a high global warming potential. Uh, and then now, the parties of the Montreal Protocol are, uh, uh, with, uh, I mean, they, they are really concerned about phasing in HFCs of, uh, and producing or increasing uh, more the, the the climate problem. However, the alternatives uh, to HCFCs must be there in the market. And nowadays, there is a very interesting uh, phenomenon. Parties, most of the developing countries are conscious of the problem of phasing in HFCs. And they are willing to, uh, to receive additional funds as long as uh, to use climate uh, change friendly alternatives instead of using H. Uh, HFCs. So the challenge now is how to do this in a timely and, uh, and, and proper manner so that developing countries will manage to comply with their obligations without aggravating 
uh, the climate uh, change problem. Um, these HFCs are growing very fast, and they are growing at, uh, at a pace of around 8% uh, per year, and, um, and uh, several parties within the Montreal Protocol uh, have put forward uh, an amendment to the Montreal Protocol to include HFCs, uh, the consumption, the use, the production and, and consumption of HFCs within the Montreal Protocol not the emissions, because HFCs are regulated under the, under the Kyoto Protocol. It's one substance that is part of the Kyoto basket of gases. So this is a very, very interesting uh, issue that is uh, being debated in the Montreal Protocol and in the climate uh, treaties as well. And it is interesting because it, it, it has to do with the, with the architecture of the international uh, treaties, with the architecture and the governance of, uh, of, the, of the multilateral environmental treaties. And uh, how this is going to be addressed, it is in the hands of the governments. And um, so, and indeed, it is a challenge for the parties uh, to, to do a transition out of HCFCs without knowing that in the next, in the early future, they will need to move out again of another substance if they choose to use HFCs. So it's a real challenge, and um, it's a fascinating challenge in terms of, of how parties are going to to a governments of the world are going to address this issue because at the same governments that are parties to the climate treaties, same governments that are parties to the Montreal Protocol. So with this, um, I will uh, thank you for your um, patience and, um, and I, I am ready to address any, any questions. If I cannot uh, answer you any of these questions. There are many awesome officers here in this room that uh, I will look at them for, uh, to complement the, or to, to address any questions. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marco. Um, um, it's, it's really interesting to firstly see how you've married the science to the policy. I think as scientists sometimes, as I was saying earlier, we get lost in the molecular aspects of DNA damage from UV radiation and we, we forget to look up and think about what we're doing actually means to a, a wider public. And I think one of the, one of the <coughs> duties of science scientists is to communicate more and better with policy makers. I'm intrigued still by the successes of the Montreal Protocol and um, I, I suspect others will ask questions on that that we may come back to. And there were some other thoughts that ran through my head as you were speaking. I was wondering, for example, if, if someone could very quickly prove that carbon dioxide and methane are ODSs. Um, if we could get those added on the list under the Montreal <laughs> Protocol, that may also help the climate change issue along a little bit. And then rather abstractly, I thought about goats, which may sound a little strange, but um, earlier in the week when I was coming in one morning, there was um, a discussion on the radio uh, a musician, a, a cellist, a world famous cellist was producing a, a piece of music um, which he titled The Goat Rodeo Sessions. Now being a relative arrival to Trinidad and Tobago, I'd heard of goat racing and even lost a few dollars on them, but um, I'd never heard of a goat rodeo. And um, this cellist described what a goat rodeo was. It's used in many situations, um, quite often in aviation, and it describes a situation where if you can think of anything else that can go wrong, you're, you're doing very well because everything that you can think of that may bring a plane down to crash, for example, is happening. 
the pilot has got sick, one of the engines is on fire, someone's had a heart attack in the passenger cabin. Complete chaotic situation pushing this plane onto disaster, at which point you need a hundred good things to happen at once to prevent that from happening and for people to be able to walk away from a, a near disaster. And I guess what I thought was that we in the environmental field, we hear about the catalogue of things that appear to be going wrong, whether it's climate change, ozone depletion, loss of biodiversity, exhaustion of fisheries, deforestation, all these things that seem to be causing the sort of chaotic situation driving us towards a sorry state on the environmental front. And here we have our first of the hundred good pieces of news that may prevent that cataclysm from happening. So my impression over the week has been that the Montreal Protocol Vienna Convention really offer a beacon that hopefully the environmental movement, but also governments, can take forward and apply to other situations um, to reverse the often very negative news we hear about on the environment. So, slightly abstract, but go. So, um, at this question, at uh, this time, I'd like to open the, the floor to questions. If there's anyone who would like to. Howard. I think I can talk about that mic. You uh, sure? So, what a great talk, fantastic. <laughs> okay, Marco, well, so great talk. And uh, what I wanted to ask was if you had the chance to talk to your colleagues at CBD, so the executive on the secretary of CBD, if there was one thing you could tell him about the successes that you all have had with Montreal, what was it, what, what would it be that you would say to the Executive Secretary of CBD about what they should do uh, about the Biodiversity Convention and the challenges that they're having in getting the world to meet its uh, biodiversity targets? Tough question. Yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll scrub it off my list. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Should we take one at a time? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a tough question. Um, first of all, I would like to refer to, to the issue of uh, the joke that you were saying with regard to <coughs> uh, CO2, bringing it into the Montreal Protocol. Um, the, 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 the parties uh, actually is, Several of the of the gases uh, of the Kyoto uh, or the Kyoto basket of gases are also depleting substances, and um, but the parties decided to to deal with them uh, separately, not from the awesome uh, uh, aspect, but from the uh, from the climate impact, in particular uh, CO2, which is. Um, is very um, is growing very rapidly, um, but uh, with regard to what to tell to one of my colleagues uh, in other international treaties, is is very difficult. It's a, it's a tough question. It's a tough question because <clears throat> I was saying that quite often we in the Secretariat find ourselves walking in a very fine line, um, the line of, of the frontier, frontiers of uh, conflicts between policy and science or between being policy prescriptive or being policy relevant when we are um, advising the governments or preparing for their meetings or writing documents for the meetings. For the, for the governments, um, preparing the agenda and the program, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we are always walking a fine line. Um, and the Secretariat 
to the to the internet to these treaties is uh, is there to serve the governments. So what I could say to to this uh, the example that you put is is that uh, I mean the secretariats must serve the governments the governments well and must produce the the best documents possible must give the best uh, scenarios possible uh, so that decisions are being taken in favor of uh, to address the, the challenges um, yeah, but biodiversity is it's a, it's a very sad example of what is happening um, and uh, and yes governments need to do much more to protect uh, uh, our global commons. There is, thank you very much, uh, there, is a, there is a movement also uh, which is taking more and more uh, uh, adepts to, to refer to biodiversity as one of our global commons in spite of being located in Trinidad uh, or in Costa Rica or in, um, in the Antarctic, uh, but yes, it's one of the of the global commons that are disappearing without us realizing it. We are absolutely ignorant about the inventories of uh, of species in in my country. I am from Costa Rica, and um, we only know we reckon that in Costa Rica we only know about 15 percent of the total species there. And there is a huge effort invested in, in inventory and inventory with toxologists and uh, students and everybody is working on that. And it, so what is happening? What is disappearing at the fungus level, level kingdom? We don't know. So yes, secretariats are there to serve as well as possible, as, uh, the best way possible the governments in their efforts to protect the global commons. Any more questions? Yes, please. Not so much a question, but thank you for a um, marvellous address. Um, I came here tonight expecting to hear a bad news story <coughs> and like other people I've heard a good news story. Um, are you doing enough to tell the world about this? Because I honestly didn't know that we were succeeding with the ozone problem. So my question is, are you doing enough to tell everybody that this is a major environmental success story? Yeah. Uh, Simple question, simple answer, no. <laughs> um, we are doing a lot, but not enough. Um, we have uh, four implementing agencies, UNDP, UNEP, UNIDO and, um, and, and the World Bank. We have presence in all the countries of the world. Uh, there are programs, there are, um, these agencies have uh, very aggressive um, uh, awareness raising programs, in particular uh, UNEP. And um, we, we always, we are always in, in the news uh, because of uh, breaking or new research uh, evidence or, or new situations. The latest one is uh, the, the issue of what it was, it has been uh, called as the Antarctic, uh, the, An the Arctic uh, Ozone awesome Hole, which is, is, is uh, debatable. Uh, but um, 
but it will bring more attention to the problems of the ozone layer. Uh, uh, and, and probably scientists are also feeling this, this lack of, uh, of awareness raising or, 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 or uh, the diffusion of, of, the, of, the, um, of the message. And, um, and this, I guess, will help them in their research activities, but also will raise, you know, it was in the economy, it was in the nature, but it was in the economist, it was in the, in the newspapers. It made the headlines on, on some newspapers. So, um, the fact is that, that we are fighting for a space in the media with uh, very gigantic uh, problems. And one of the biggest problems is climate change. So there is a big confusion in my family between what am I doing, what, what is my work? And then my mother or my sister or my brother keep on asking me, but why is so bad? You're doing so bad with climate change. No, I don't work in climate change. I work in the protection. It's very difficult. Is 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 really difficult, and uh, and yes, we need to do much more. Are there any more questions from the floor? Perhaps I could ask a quick please, question myself. Please. Then. Um, I think another of the successes you highlighted was the fact that you you managed to get countries to adopt a precautionary principle, which again, many of the other multilateral treaties haven't been able to do. And I'm still intrigued by, you highlighted some of the reasons that you thought that the Montreal Protocol had been successful, but I wondered if there's any other drivers that you would identify as being things that helped, for example, to get countries to adopt a precautionary principle. For example, um, I, I'm young enough to remember when the, the ozone hole was first described. And I, I think I remember there being a sense of shock that we had done this thing and it had happened so quickly. And I just wonder whether the sense of shock globally was enough to actually get governments to think, well, we will start to act on this even though we don't have the scientific proof. Yes, the, the, during, you see, the Vienna Convention was adopted in 1985. And um, it was adopted under a skepticism, uh, uh, still and under a lot of skepticism from several scientists and the commercial uh, manufacturers or the, the, the producers of chemicals. And um, this, this Vienna Convention, which I didn't mention, but, but was the charge of uh, promoting research and information sharing. And um, so it was a real success to do it under clear evidence, absolute concrete and uh, evidence. It was only done on those research papers that I mentioned and, uh, and the assessment, uh, the, the, um, the assessment done by the, by the National Academy of Science in the US. The Montreal Protocol, however, was adopted in 1987 and by 1985, the concept of the ozone layer was being uh, uh, floated. Uh, uh, and that, that image was, to me, a powerful image to not only to adopt the Montreal Protocol at that time, but, but also to raise awareness. At the schools, everybody knows about the ozone hole. It's a powerful image to motivate your parents who didn't know about the ozone depletion, or the kids' parents that didn't know about it. So it, it's, it, it, look to, going back to the question on biodiversity or climate change, we need 
a powerful image that will motivate the civil society to act. And, uh, and, and, and of course, governments and politicians are very, very willing to listen to what is happening. And if there is no real pressure from the general society or there are all the problems that are to be addressed, then uh, international uh, action is, is, uh, is delayed. Nowadays, I have to say that, uh, that, that really coming up with new international agreements or, or breaking uh, or even approving amendments to the existing uh, 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 treaties is proving very difficult. I mean, the alignment of wills and, uh, and, and national positions of different countries is, is extremely, extremely difficult. Um, even aligning the, 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 the different factions in, uh, at, the, at the national level is proving...